Welcome everyone to the fourth webinar in our webinar series on integrating with Archive Space. Each webinar in this series will highlight an integration with another application used in archives that Archive Space members have worked on or requested. The webinar series will feature both open source and proprietary systems. Our fourth webinar in this series will feature an integration with the audiovisual publishing platform Aviary. In this webinar, Bertram Lyons of Aviary will provide an overview of Aviary, highlighting access controls, accessibility, and compliance. He will also demonstrate how Aviary integrates with ArchivesSpace and how this integration benefits archivists, specifically archivists from smaller organizations. Kevin Glick of Yale University Libraries will present on Yale's integration of ArchivesSpace and Aviary. The presentation will highlight how Yale recognized the need for this integration within the libraries and both their vision and their experience implementing this integration. Kevin will also offer recommendations to other users considering integration. We will hold all questions until the Q&A session at the end. If you type a question into the chat, it will be read and answered during the Q&A. You will notice your microphone and camera were muted when you entered. We ask that you keep your microphone muted until the Q&A session at the end. Your presenters today are Bertram Lyons and Kevin Glick. Bertram Lyons specializes in the acquisition, management, and preservation of documentary research and cultural heritage collections. He has developed tools, policies, and partnerships around the development and management of analog and digital archival collections. For 15 years, Bert has worked as an archivist for extensive archives, first at the Allen Lomax Archive, and most recently at the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. Bert is active with professional archival organizations, including the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, the Society of American Archivists, the Association of Recorded Sound Collections, and the Association of Moving Image Archivists. He has also received certification from the Academy of Certified Archivists and is a graduate of the Archives Leadership Institute. He holds an MA in Museum Studies with a focus in American Studies and Archival Theory from the University of Kansas. Kevin Glick is Head of Digitization and Digital Preservation and Archivist in Yale University Libraries Manuscripts and Archives, where he currently focuses on digitization, digital libraries, and other technology issues in special collections and archives. In addition, Kevin manages the architecture of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, Digital Preservation and Access Systems, as well as digitization of all materials related to the collection. Welcome, Bert and Kevin. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is Bert Lyons from AVP, and I'm going to start the conversation today, and then Kevin will pick up afterwards, um, after, after I'm finished and carry on to the end. So thank you all for being here today. Um, let me get started. So I was, we're going to focus, as, as, as noted, on aviary and archive space and the relationship between these two systems, um, specifically looking at the, the improvements to discovery and access that these, these relationships um, have brought. But before I get started, um, for any of you who aren't familiar with AVP, which is, which is the organization that I'm representing today, just a quick um, note about AVP as an organization so you have a sense of where um, I'm coming from and who I am today. But I'll, I'll say a AVP, you can see in front of you our vision and our mission and our core values as an organization. Um, as I'll point out specifically that one of our main goals, the vision, is this concept of freeing organizations from obstacles of information management. So we are trying our best to provide services and, and, and solutions that help people um, overcome these kinds of obstacles that um, are in, their, in, in the way of them achieving their missions. Um, a quick sense of who we work with um, and where we work. We work we're in, uh, in academic um, organizations and, and federal um, organizations with uh, museums, with archives, with libraries, broadcast organizations. Um, we work also internationally as well, just to give you a sense of some of the experience that, that we bring to the, to the table. Um, and the kinds of things we do is we largely are a consulting and strategic planning organization uh, originally. So we do a lot of work around assessments and audits and technology integration and planning um, and data migration and data transformation. But we've ultimately over the past five or six years developed ourselves into also a software development company um, because of the amount of work we've been doing uh, with data and, and, and software. And specifically, this came out of originally digital preservation work that we were doing. Um, but today I'm here to talk about Aviary, which is one of AVPs, which is why I talked a little bit about AVP, which is one of AVP's uh, software products. It's a software as a service platform that we've built alongside our partners 
at Yale University, uh, the Fortunoff um, Archive, who, who Kevin also represents. Uh, but we've we've built this platform with the with the goal of of providing um, a very specific uh, very specific features which focus around improving access to audiovisual collections online um, and specifically thinking about our colleagues in archives and libraries um, who have who have obstacles with regard to getting audiovisual content online that have to do with a variety of things um, and aviary is trying to fill in those gaps. Uh, as much as possible. One of the key features of Aviary has to do with unified services. So what, what we want to do is, and what, what I mean by unified services is that we all know that as organizations we use so many different services when it comes to um, digital media, digital audiovisual content, and that might be things like Preservica for, for preservation storage, or Kaltura for storage and access, or Vimeo uh, for public access, or um, Google Drive just for sharing things, or Archive space, as we're talking about today, for descriptive information um, and, and and inventory management. Right, we might use YouTube, or might want to reach out to something like IBM Watson. We felt like Aviary is the kind of we wanted to build a lightweight system that would focus on being able to integrate with as many services as needed, um, instead of trying to create more and more silos for people. Um, so Aviary does not actually care where your digital media live and are, and are preserved or, or, or managed and, and nor does it care where your descriptive metadata lives as long as it can connect to that descriptive metadata. Our ultimate goal is to let Aviary be a, um, a, a, a surface through which you can provide access to content from a variety of locations. And similarly because of that we also want to unify some content so you've probably experienced in your day-to-day -day work that you know, we might store and manage oral history and archive material, uh, audiovisual material in one way, or we might have marketing material that's audiovisual, we might have meetings or webinars or podcasts or research uh, materials. Uh, we have a variety of kinds of, of digital audiovisual content that, that are kept um, largely curatorially in different places, which makes a lot of sense, but there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for providing searchability across a variety of these kinds of, of content um, and Aviary's, one of Aviary's goals to unify this content. Um, and additionally, we want to unify the user experience. We want people to be able to not only uh, search for, for records about audiovisual content, obviously, but to be able to, to see them and to interact with them, to play them back, to uh, be able to share them, to be able to navigate through the timelines of audiovisual content uh, which is often something that's very under-supported. We can, we can provide metadata that might get you to an hour-long video file or an audio recording, um, but rarely do our services um, before aviary um, services bring us into the five-minute mark and 30-second uh, mark to get exactly to the thing that the search result um, is trying to, to provide for the user. So aviary is focused on these kinds of things. We also focused on unified management, um, making sure that users of Aviary have a sense, have the ability to say how content is accessed um, at a variety of levels, uh, which, at, uh, this which column here talks about which levels, um, you might want to protect access to entire collections or to just single resources or to single media files or to single metadata. Um, we wanted to be able to support the flexibility there, um, as well as who. So who can access what um, is important, whether it's a spe specific user or a group of users or um, specific organizations, when these things can be accessed, can they be accessed indefinitely uh, according to certain time ranges, and where they can be accessed. Um, we want to restrict IP addresses, um, or on the other side of that, be able to push content out of Aviary onto other targets as well. Um, so these are all really important features that Aviary offers as well as individual branding because I mentioned previously this is a software as a service um, but we want organizations to be able to to have a site an aviary site that looks like their own that is their own that they have total control of the look and feel um, so this is an aviary website just like this is an aviary website um, different organizations have the ability to customize um, a variety of the features on the CSS um, side of the site so real quickly, all, all of you in the, um, who are, if you're archive space users and, 
obviously interested in the data models and how those are going to relate to each other. Um, the aviary data sees the world. We tried to develop the, um, a fairly simple um, data model with, within aviary so that we could provide as much um, mapping support as possible from a variety of, of systems. So it, it is a very basic um, data model with an organization or a site being sort of the, the top of the hierarchy uh, at any given time. Um, that organization has one or more collections. Each collection has one or more resources. These resources are the, um, the intellectual thing that, that the, the, in archive space speak, this might be an archival, uh, an archival object that's um, actually going to be delivered out to, to somebody that has um, its own intellectual description. Um, it, the resource, can have one or more media files, so you could imagine a, an interview that has one um, media, one actual video file associated with it, but you can also imagine um, a interview that has six different videos files associated with it, and each of them are one, one part of a single interview. Um, so there's flexibility there, as well as each media file itself has, has a timeline. And so that's where the time-based media, time-based metadata can attach. So for a given media file that's an audio or video file, um, it itself can have an index that gives markers into the um, timeline as well as transcripts that talk about exactly what um, words are being said at a given time as well as closed captions. Um, I'm going to quickly note that um, in all transparency, I am traveling today and at the airport. So if you hear things behind me, I have no control over that. I'm trying my best. Um, so the general data model is, is this. Um, the resources, this intellectual object that's being delivered through aviary is where descriptive metadata sits. Um, we have a, by default, a Dublin core based uh, metadata model, and that is um, extensible by the each organization at each collection level. At each collection level, you can add as many key value type um, uh, metadata elements as you would like. Um, and so we, we've been, we've done mapping already from EAD mods and Mark, and of course, um, we map from, from an, an original da data source through into, into aviary that way. Um, and when, and when we search in aviary, we search against not just the descriptive meta metadata on a resource, uh, but all of the time-based metadata like indexes, transcripts, or closed captions that you have attached to your media files, if you have. Um, so try, try to provide extremely rich search, which is one of the main features. I mentioned previously, permissions can be managed um, independently at every level. You can, you can have totally public resources with some private media files, some public media files, some private indexes, some public indexes, et cetera, and you can mix and match to whatever need you have for your particular content um, to try to increase the abil your ability to make the, the content at least discoverable, if not accessible. Sites generally in aviary look a little bit like this. Um, this is a landing page for, a, for an organization site. And as I said, it sort of focuses on featuring the, uh, the data model. You have collections. You can also navigate through all the resources in a browse mode. Um, advanced search gives you the ability to filter and facet and search, um, of course, through everything in your content, in your collection. Um, each collection has its own landing page that you can customize the look and feel of and the text, obviously. Um, and each resource has its what we call the resource def the resource detail page, which is what you're seeing here. Um, this is a resource detail page, and it features sort of a T-shaped approach. On the on the left, you'll see the player, um, as well as a timeline underneath the player. Those blue those blue lines that you see there are connected into the index tab, um, which we can talk about in a little bit, um, as well as some basic metadata. Um, that we call tombstone metadata that you get to select um, aside from title, collection, organization, you can select up to two or three um, metadata elements from your resources in a given collection that always appear as part of the card for the, uh, for the particular resource when it appears on the, uh, in the website. But the description tab, which we're not looking at, which is not blue, um, the description tab has the full metadata um, attached to it for the resource and the transcript and the index tabs contain any transcripts connected to the particular media file that's being played at a given moment in time. What you see here, the transcript uh, for this particular resource is being displayed um, with the currently. 
So the media files themselves, we have a little drop down where the media where you, a user can navigate through if there are more than one media files associated with the resource. Um, and the index and the transcript are tabs that as you click on them, they sort of dynamically load there. Um, Aviary features two very important search approaches. One is to search within a resource. So every res resource is searchable. Um, you can see the search bar up at the top. You can see a, a search result having been carried out here for the word barrels. And we're seeing that there are, there are 15 total hits on barrels across the, all the data um, sets for currently, this is just showing us there are 15 hits in the index tab. So the index tab is blue, it's highlighted. Right next to index, we see 15 hits. And in the navigation above it, where you can navigate up and down through those hits, um, we're, we're currently looking at the second of 15 hits in the index for the word barrels on this particular uh, resource because there's so much metadata that can be attached to resources. It doesn't have to be, but that it can be. Um, the search results can be pretty rich, driving people deep, deep into the recording instead of just to the top level. You also can search across resources, and this is the big, big powerful part of Aviary is once you have lots of content from a variety of collections in the system, um, searching, searching both simple and advanced searches um, bring back pretty rich opportunities to identify um, not just in the description but across transcripts and indexes where we have similarity across across resources so here one of the key features is not easily um, seen with right now and I can't point to it I don't believe but if you look in the first card um, at the uh, on the search result set there you'll see the the words found in colon and then you'll see barrels colon and then you'll see Description one, index title two, index 13, and transcript 79. That's a count of the total times barrel was found in those particular uh, metadata areas within this particular resource. Um, so it's a quick, quick way to try to deliver some relevance information to the user. Um, what you typically find is you search for barrels or you search for whatever you're searching for, and you might see a list of things that um, have that word in them, but it's when there's so much metadata, it's really difficult to identify a the relevance and b where it, where it is that that um, that word or the the string or the or the variety of words if you search for a variety of of, of elements um, where they are actually located within the file itself. So some additional features related to um, Aviary, I just want to point out, although we're not talking about them today, is that it does feature automated metadata um, within the application. So if you are storing and loading video or audio files into Aviary, you can um, push out to, to us, to IBM Watson for speech to text. Um, let's see, someone just wrote a note. Let me see if that's to me. What's an index? Good question. Um, I think we'll get to that uh, at the end. Um, but largely an index is a time point, basically a marker. You might say at minute one, second 10, something happened. At two minutes, 30 seconds, something happened. At five minutes, something happened, and that creates an index of the recording to allow somebody to quickly jump through uh, the recording instead of having to listen in real time. So, but we can talk more about that shortly. Um, to go back here, let me make sure I didn't skip something. Yeah, so I was talking about speech to text with IBM Watson. So that's by default, IBM Watson's connected to to Aviary and um, organizations have the ability to send um, files out to IBM Watson and have them come directly back to Aviary and be loaded into Aviary. Um, there's no extra charge from Aviary to do that, but you are charged for IBM Watson. It's a very small amount of cents per minute, um, but that's a pass-through charge if you do want to use that. Um, permissions and access requests are a very big part of Aviary um, that themselves could take an entire um, webinar to, to go through, but if at the end, if you have questions, if Kevin hasn't covered how some of these are, are worked with, um, Aviary is very, has very um, deep uh, ability to allow a, an organization to communicate with its users and vice versa so that users can request access to not currently public material um, and to have a workflow within the system to carry out that access request and, um, and complete it and ultimately provide access um, if desired by the organization to that user. Um, Aviary also features a collection level RSS feeds, which is a very 
new but an uh, interesting feature that that we've we've developed for people who want to create podcasts. So Aviary can this is a side note, but Aviary itself can serve as a podcast feed um, to any, and it's already being supported in Spotify and um, and by Apple iTunes as well as by um, Google Podcasts. So the but the key thing today is integrations with external systems, um, and specifically we're going to talk about Archive Space. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how that works in Aviary, and Kevin's going to show you the specifics. So I might go quickly through some some of the things to give you some familiarity, but Kevin will talk a little bit more specifically. Um, the basic approach for how A Space and, and Aviary work together currently is that we use the archival object ID from 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 Archive Space um, to be basically a map to a single Aviary resource. So whatever level archival object ID that you have that represents some item. That's an audiovisual item. Um, that thing can now can that identifier is what Aviary is going to be looking for from to be given uh, from you to create this relationship. And Aviary will assume that it's going to it's going to map metadata from that at least from that level um, object and maybe some others depending upon what kind of customization you would need. Um, but it would map metadata from that level as well as look at the digital objects attached to that archival object. Um, and those digital objects that meet a certain criteria uh, determined by you all, um, and Kevin will talk a little bit about some examples, um, that that digital object in archive space, we use the, the, this URI from that to go and actually uh, acquire the binary media object that's going to be moved into Aviary as, as one or one of the children of the, the Aviary resource that, um, that's being created. So the general example here showing archive space as the central um, descriptive metadata um, uh, home in this example. The Preservica example is just to demonstrate one of, of any kind of targets where the digital object itself could be stored. In this example, um, showing you um, archive space working with Preservica and Aviary. You could have archive space working with Google Drive and Aviary or archive space working with um, S3 and Aviary or wherever it is that you have your, wherever, archive space is pointing to, um, to files from the digital object. So currently what happens is um, in archive space, an archival object um, is connected over to an aviary resource. That archival object has one or more digital objects attached to it, and aviary goes, follows those leads over to wherever those are stored. In this example, they're in Preservica. So, and uh, aviary follows that over to a deliverable unit, um, and then to a digital file, um, to which point we can bring that right back over to um, aviary as the media file one second please but okay um so, so the this is the general approach. I'm, I'm sorry, I was just sharing some information with a neighbor. Within Aviary, what happens is we give the archive space. Um, integration is set up, then an, a, a user will basically go through the process of um, authenticating. Um, in this example, this is an archive space and Preservica. Again, like I said, that may not be the relationships that you have, but the archive space credentials are the important part here. Um, and then the users can provide one or more archival object IDs. You can see here in the top left that a user is providing one. In a comma-separated list, a user can provide as many as they'd like. Um, and in this particular example, an apiary goes through and, um, and can preview this mapping for the user so they can see the mapping that's been created. Um, additionally, the user can just run the sync instead of previewing, in which case the same approach. Archival object IDs are provided. Um, synchronization will ultimately create this particular uh, resource in this example um, where the media and the came in this example came from Preservica and the metadata came from archive space and what's ultimately happening behind the scene is that that archival object is driving um, Aviary to walk through the archival object metadata through the API and archive space to pull out the metadata that's been mapped uh, to identify digital objects in archive space and to follow those to the digital object records and to follow, to look for URIs that are, that are there then actionable by Aviary to go and get binary media files. 
Um, in this example, it goes over to Preservica, it follows the lead over there to pull out the uh, digital media files from Preservica that were ultimately mapped to Aviary. And then at the very end, Aviary creates a digital object record back in archive space on the archival object that's, that signifies the existence of a new digital object in Aviary for, um, for that particular archival object. Uh, in the Yale example, which Kevin will show you, that ultimately makes its way back and creates a link between archive space and aviary. Um, and aviary stores itself a link back to archive space. So you sort of have, once that's in place, you have a nice round trip between the two systems. And, and with that, I am going to uh, pass this over to Kevin. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions at the end that I can. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is Kevin Glick, Yale University Library. So um, we're now gonna just talk about some, about uh, Yale specifically a little bit and uh, do a little run through of how this looks in archive space and uh, aviary and then hope, uh, hopefully leave plenty of time to uh, have a question and answer for very specific information that anybody would like to, to would like to talk about. So um, as Bert said, Aviary was developed through a partnership between AVP and the Fortunoff Video Archive of, for Holocaust Testimonies here at Yale University Library. As such, many of its features are the result of specific systems needs expressed by Fortunoff and other Yale Archival Collections staff. Today we're really focusing on a subset of those expressed needs uh, and those that have to do with uh, this integration between archive space and, and aviary. Some of the most important needs of an online access system for AV surrounded basic issues of metadata creation and ingest of digital resources. These issues were important to us because of the size of our collections and the difficulties we'd been having with ingest and ongoing updates in our other digital library systems. The system needs to be easy for staff to ingest content and associated metadata and to make ongoing updating easy by allowing staff to work directly in our authoritative descriptive and collection management system, which is archive space. Ingest and updating is no small issue for many organizations. The size of the collection, the sheer number of resources and mass of metadata and its ongoing variability can make it very difficult to set up ingest and maintain metadata and most digital library systems. Sometimes the work can be so difficult that it threatens the su successful implementation of the system. We faced those issues uh, when we set up previous systems, taking months to ingest videos into streaming services and associating metadata to tie it all together. Even after ingest, the process of maintaining the data over time as description improves and changes can be cumbersome. It was vital to us that the new system made this process easier on our staff and was more efficient. To that end, Aviary allows us to describe all of our AV content in our own system, archive space, and to enable automated ingest of metadata and content, as well as to enable efficient ongoing synchronization of all of this over time. So uh, Bert showed you a few versions of uh, the diagram that I've got here, uh, comparing the data models a little bit between archive space and aviary. Because archive space is flexible and allows quite a bit of variability in how an organization can arrange and describe AV resources, or really any archival collections, Aviary can't be a single one-size-fits-all integration where this is how it always works in all situations. It's necessary to work with organizations to tailor the integration to meet each organization's needs. So uh, Bert showed you some of the examples of how, how this happens, but uh, it, this tailoring needs to happen at a couple of different levels. It needs to to happen at this sort of uh, conceptual object level uh, because 
uh, it's actually possible for AV objects to be described uh, at, in different records inside archive space. So uh, an example that we'll talk about, the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, um, shown here in archive space, um, is a collection of 4,500 video testimonies, sort of uh, video oral histories, uh, on uh, about 12 and a half thousand video tapes. And uh, the decision by that organization was to make each interview its own resource in archive space. Thus, the connection between uh, archive space and aviary is uh, resource to resource, sort of that naming in there. However, the more like the example that uh, that Burke gave uh, is one here. Here is manuscripts and archives uh, at Yale Library. Um, the, we have a collection of uh, documentation of a television show in the 80s documenting the end of apartheid called South Africa Now. Uh, and it has traditional archival series, subseries, groups, and uh, the the works, uh, the digital, the AV is described in as archival objects. And so then uh, the connection there it, between archive space and aviary is archival object to resource and then the archive space resource to collection. Um, Beyond uh, the mapping of the conceptual object, uh, how uh, the objects are conceived of in archive space and then uh, mapping that to, to aviary, it, uh, it's necessary to uh, map uh, the uh, archive space metadata fields to aviary on the case that uh, you might have a, a variability in how you're describing or use custom fields or notes in some way that you want that to map differently to aviary. Mostly Yale is uh, doing a little bit better job in using a similar uh, use of metadata fields uh, um, from uh, repository to repository, but that can change and that's something that needs to be tailored. Uh, and then another thing that needs to be tailored and I'll get into that a little bit more is how it is you want to synchronize between a archive space and aviary, and a lot of that has to do with the homogeneous, sorry, how homogeneous uh, your uh, collections are in archive space or how clustered they are in collections or if they're dispersed among little tiny parts of different collections than the sync might need to happen in different ways. And I'll talk about some examples and how that, that plays out. So uh, let's go back to some examples here. So uh, this Fortunoff Video Archives example that I, I brought out, uh, here's the archive space record for uh, HVT1 uh, AVA B, which is, uh, has, as I said, a resource record that describes the testimony and then the hierarchical description that one might think of the archival objects in here are actually describing different generations of uh, videotape uh, from master, duplicate, restoration master, restoration submaster, and use copy, as well as other kinds of administrative documents and metadata related to that thing. So in the master here, uh, the, there happens to be uh, three physical objects that originally existed, umatic video cassettes that were digitized and stored in Preservica. Bert talked about how this could be integrated with Preservica. That's what we're using here at Yale. And so then we've got three different recordings, part one, part two, and part three, that are all st stored in Preservica. Uh, along with the, uh, the videos themselves, for this, we've got indexes. And uh, Bert talked a little bit about indexes. Uh, in, for the Fortune of Video Archives, uh, indexes are uh, first-person English uh, 
time-coded sum summary notes of a portion of the time. So it will say, it will take a say five minute uh, period and say, in this five minutes, the the interviewee talked about the ghettos in Warsaw or or something along those lines. And so we are uh, uh, we are storing those in Preservica. Yeah, and we have one for every video, but I wanted to show an example here uh, that um, it doesn't need to be Preservica, it can be Google Drive in this case, and uh, it doesn't really matter for uh, the aviary integration, it's just something that during the uh, tailoring that we're working with AVP uh, that, you, that you describe about where you're keeping these things and that you're uh, storing them and have the dig digital objects created in a similar manner that then can be mapped. We also then have the same thing for transcripts and captions. So uh, how that same uh, resource looks in Aviary, uh, I'm using the staff view here, so this uh, tab along the side, that, that doesn't show up for uh, external users, but to show you all this, I sort of need to be in the staff view. So uh, it, it shows here and uh, it's customizable based on the tailoring that you set up on how you want your archive space field to display in the descriptive tab at the right and how, which of those fields you want to also display in the, or either or in the tombstone below uh, the media player at the top. Then there are additional tabs if you have those other kinds of metadata, which we do for uh, for Fortunoff in this example. And so you can see these these index uh, segments that uh, are time coded, and uh, you can click on any one of these uh, segments, and it will take you to the video, which I don't want to play while we're uh, while we're all here on the webinar. Um, so I won't click on any one of these, and then. Uh, in this example, then we've got also got transcripts uh, for each uh, for many of these videos. So whereas we have uh, indexes for most of the 12,500 videos, uh, we've just begun in the last year or so to start to do actual word-for-word -word transcripts, and so we've only uh, have uh, a little less than a thousand transcripts at this point. But this is an example of how this works, and uh, if you uh, uh, make captions, which in this case we've got both uh, transcripts and captions, and the user wants to set the captioning on, uh, then the captions will automatically play uh, in the media player as you go along. The other thing I'll just quickly show, since Bert just showed a, a screenshot, if there are multiple parts to, uh, to the resource, then uh, this little hamburger uh, opens up and shows you uh, the different uh, uh, the different parts and one can move from one to the other and then when you go to the index or transcript for that then it's going to be displaying uh, the appropriate index or transcript and then it's going to play the appropriate uh, caption or the like. Um, let's uh, next talk a little bit about how this works in uh, Aviary to set up the synchronization. Uh, Bert showed you a few uh, uh, quickly what this looks like a little bit, but uh, in the staff view there after working with AVP to set up how this might tailor, uh, you will have uh, one to several integrations if you don't can't set on one tailoring because maybe you have a few different variants on how you're setting things up in archive space. Uh, but for Fortune Off, there is one. And so there's this one integration that is set up in archive space. And then you need to uh, go through and uh, fill out your credentials, uh, which uh, these are mine for archive space and Preservica. And then uh, you need to uh, create the synchronizations and connect them to existing collections. So we didn't talk too much about what collections were, but that's a thing that can be different from uh, repository to repository. Uh, mostly, Fortunoff has created collections by different types of restrictions. 
uh, so it's not like it's an archival collection. So the vast majority of the resources are unrestricted, and then there are edited testimonies in private and and the like. Uh, but these uh, archive space integrations that you're going to set up is going to be tied to one of one of the collections. Until uh, as Bert showed, uh, you'll uh, go through this, and the first time you'll see that I've already synced things previously. Uh, and so I had the choice of resync, but if this was synced the first time, uh, it will then ask you if you want to sync everything. So this is one of the tailoring that one can do. Fortunoff has the ability to just say, since we have digitized all the material and described it all in archive space, uh, the entire archive space repository can be mined to create the entire aviary collection. And so for Fortunoff, we asked for that uh, set up, and, that, and so that's a choice. We can uh, sync everything in the collection, and that will take a while because there's a lot of videos, and it takes time to create all the metadata, but also then to create all the resources in the cloud and, and build that all out. Or one could just uh, pick one to many uh, resources in, for Fortunoff, this would be a resource in archive space, and then sync those. Uh, the other thing that we're using, Bert mentioned the thing about restrictions. So uh, we're, uh, uh, we also have the ability to uh, utilize uh, uh, write statements in uh, archive space to limit which, how things are synchronized. And so uh, in this, there is a little choice here to, uh, it's uh, the default for Fortunoff is to only sync things that do not have a, a an access restriction um, unless we mark that we're going to synchronize restricted. So uh, in the example of Fortunoff, I'd probably only do that when I'm uh, synchronizing this restricted uh, collection, which is a small collection. Uh, and uh, after you enter those things in, you say yes, and then it proceeds in the background and these statuses change from stopped or completed to queued and then in progress and then uh, completed uh, once it gets to the end and gives you a log to follow along. Um, let's uh, quickly show a, a different example from manuscripts and archives. So, uh, as I said, the South Africa Now collection in Manuscripts and Archives um, is uh, one of about uh, 150 different archival collections in Manuscripts and Archives that has AV material that's been either acquired digital or it has been digitized. Uh, and then we've described those items at the uh, archival object level. So in here, you get your series and your subseries, and then you've got your archival object and then that archival object has both the physical uh, instance describing the box which probably was a VHS uh, in this case maybe it was a, a beta SP and uh, then the digital object the the preservation master stored in in Preservica and so um, that Sorry, let me pull this up. Uh, if we find that, how that looks in uh, aviary uh, is something like this. So uh, you can see that uh, we've got a lot less archival description for this collection in manuscripts and archives than we did for Fortune Off. Aviary doesn't really have any strong opinions on how much uh, metadata you've got. This is the level that we have, and we don't have any indexes or transcripts yet. Uh, for that, maybe we will in the future, but this is how this, uh, how this looks. Um, on the integration side uh, for manuscripts and archives, uh, the synchronization is a little bit more complicated because we've got so many different collections that um, have slight differences that need to be synchronized differently, but it works essentially in the same way. You're creating con connection to uh, between uh, archive space and aviary, and then you're syncing either the entirety or a portion of that 
collection by either giving it uh, one archival object or many. Uh, in fact, there's other ways to do this. At Yale, we've integrated in Yale's music library special collections to uh, the ability to give an archival object level that is a parent that has children that then have digital objects and then it then parses down through all the children and then builds out all the resources from them. Uh, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to show this, one of these examples here, how uh, we talked about how Aviary then at the end is writing back a digital object back into archive space. Uh, that, um, that record is here and uh, it's, the organization needs to tailor that with, um, with ABP about how they want that to work. We are, we are publishing all of those because we are utilizing the archive space PUI and then those published digital objects then display uh, in uh, our archive space PUI here. Here's this episode four. I don't remember which episode we were looking at, but uh, this is one of those examples. And then uh, users can, if they're discovering through archive space PUI, uh, bring that, follow that directly on over into Avier. Okay, I don't want to spend too much more time, so I'm going to stop sharing and try and leave some time for questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bert and Kevin. That was really cool. Um, we will now open the floor to questions. So we have about 10 minutes. Um, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to, to unmute yourself now, or you can just type it into the chat. Any questions that come through the chat, I will read them. Um, but we did have the one question during the presentation about what the index is, and Bert, you did answer it on the fly, but is there anything else you wanna add about that? Um, I would just say that Aviary supports indexes um, that come in a variety of forms. So in, if you think about an index, Kevin talks about it intellectually, but actually you have, then you have, you have to actually create the data. Um, so by default, Aviary supports WebBTT, uh, which is a, um, a W3C specified standard for, um, for creating what they call video time text, or v VTT. So it's a very simple text-based approach to say, um, start time, end time, um, a title, and then a then basically a description for that start time, end time. Then you can create one or more of those um, in a text document and give that to Aviary. And Aviary will take that in and generate the the, the um, index points. Now, additionally, we support OMS, the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, um, which is a, a a very good way to create um, to to semi automate the creation of of um, time based metadata. Um, it's a great what we think is a great system as well, but by, by default, Aviary supports the ability for you to create index points in ohms, export the XML from ohms, and give that XML to Aviary, and it will load that, those index points as well. Um, so I, th I think that's just a little bit more about how to use index points in Aviary. Thanks. We don't currently have any other questions in the chat, but we'll give it a, a, a few minutes just to see if anyone is typing. Oh, we do. All right, uh, Sarit asks, do you foresee any issue with the new data model in Preservica version six? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, so that's that's a question related to uh, the, the scenario where you are using Preservica to store your digital uh, content for preservation and the, data model um, won't affect Aviary's ability to connect. Right now, we do have mappings into Preservica V5 um, for the examples that, that we were looking at, but um, V6, we, we're, we already have some example mappings. They're not in production um, in Aviary, but it, it doesn't affect it at all. Thanks. All right, another question from uh, Columbia University Libraries. Are updates slash changes to access and rights grouped within general metadata syncing or is there a separate process involving published targets? Um, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. 
or update changes to access and rights. So this is this is a um, it can it can be either way answer. And Kevin and I were actually discussing this yesterday. Um, the currently it's if we create a mapping oh um, to to use the rights information in archive space we could um, aviary can during the sync organization process to respond to that and generate the appropriate statuses in, in aviary to match that just requires a mapping that says use this field in, in a space and when the value equals x uh, make the value in aviary equal y um, so that is totally feasible um, but it's not it's not it doesn't happen by default we have to we have to map it yeah the only thing I'd add here is um, to make this work, it requires uh, a, a standardization on the part of the archives in the way that they're describing uh, those, uh, ac you know, access conditions governing access. Since uh, those do not have to be set terms, there can be a lot of different text in there, which is going to make uh, an automated mapping quite complicated. And so the work that an archives does to shore that up and make it a little bit more standard is going to make it a lot easier. Thanks. We have another question in the chat. Uh, is it necessary for the end user to create an aviary account or is there an option to leave viewing access open to everyone? I, uh, yes, there is an option for, uh, to leave it open for everyone aviary. Um, the resources in aviary can have three to one of three statuses public restricted or private um, a public resource is going to be available to any user public on the web um, they don't have to be logged in to the aviary platform in any way um, and but that 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 gives them at the resource level that will give them access to to identify that the resource exists in the system to search the metadata from the resource and to see it in search results um, you still would have the ability even at that even with a public resource to have a media file that's that's not public, in which case the user might be able to identify that something exists to discover it, but maybe you don't have the ability to, to actually provide public access to the video itself. Uh, so you have some flexibility there. You also could have the media in that case be public, in which case it, it's 100% public. Um, there's a variety of ways in which you can do that um, to, to try to, to meet your needs. Right, any other questions? Okay, in that case, I will, oh, there's a question. <laughs> um, Joshua Shaw, is there a Git repo or is the code proprietary? There is a uh, there is a public Git Git repo for some features of the Aviary um, code base. So the Aviary code base um, has a core set of functionality that is um, that is open on GitHub. That was part of our um, plan with Fortunoff to to have. So that's out there right now. Um, it's called Aviary underscore public, I believe. If you're looking for it, and um, of some features of Aviary, for instance, the integration the specific custom integrations that we've built for different organizations, um, our IBM Watson connect connector, um, some of our storage connectors that are specific to AV, AVP and, and the software as a service platform are not part of that code base, but there's a functioning um, core aviary code base out there. If you'd like to have a look at it. Does that answer your question, Joshua? He was specifically inter interested in the integration, but thanks. Okay, yeah. I'm happy to send you over um, 
don't have any code at that at that repository for the integration, but I'm certainly happy to share with you the API calls, which is largely what that integration is. If you'd like to see how we're doing it. That'd be great. And I will include um, links to the slides as well as contact information with the recording for this webinar. So you'll be able to follow up. Anyone will be able to, to follow with Bert later. Great. Okay, assuming that was the last question, uh, I will thank uh, Bert and Kevin both for being here. Um, this was really great. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, our next integration webinar will be February 19th and that will be on integrating with Archivematica. I look forward to seeing some of you then and um, have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you.